Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the Zach seminar. It's uh, my very big pleasure to introduce Kosher Birkar from University of Cambridge, uh, Fields medalist, who will speak about geometry of polarized varieties. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vanya. Uh, first of all, let me thank Vanya and all the other people who work hard to keep uh, running this seminar. It's a really great idea, and I think even it should continue after the virus. Uh, outbreak because we can hear people from around the world, not just nearby places. Um, okay, so I will talk about geometry of polarized uh, varieties. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about what I mean by polarized uh, varieties. So we will work over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, for example, just take the complex uh, numbers. Uh, although many things will make sense over any characteristic, but uh, as far as results are concerned, uh, we are for the moment limited to characteristic zero. Suppose that uh, we have a normal projective variety X and N will be an FN bit, or if you like, an ample veil divisor. Integral divisor means that all the coefficients are integers. Uh, so I will more or less use the, these notations throughout the, the talk. X will be a variety, sometimes not necessarily normal, but N will be in some sense positive, ample or just net and bit and integral divisor. So this is a, a notation. And then given this setting, uh, one can ask, uh, what can we say about the geometry of this uh, pair X and N? Um, this question is, of course, kind of vague and very general. So we can make it more, uh, a, li a little bit more specific, more precise, but uh, by what I mean by this question. Uh, for example, for every natural number n, we have a linear system, which is given by m times this divisor n. Um, so this has some global sections, or maybe not any global sections. It could be empty. And the sections of this, uh, divisor then defines a, a rational map and we ask the question for which m this defines a birational map. Uh, here note that since n is ample or nef and big then if m is sufficiently large then we know that this will define some birational map but uh, the question is for what kind of m? Can this be a birational for some uh, bounded m relatively small m or not? And another question is that under what conditions we can ensure that X together with this divisor form a bounded family. Uh, so it usually makes sense if N is effective. And this then means that whether we can embed this X into some fixed projective space with a bounded degree and the same should be done also for N. And also under what kind of conditions can we form, can we construct a moduli space for this kind of X and N? So in this case, obviously, we have to restrict ourselves to some class of X, N. So in this talk, then I will be just exploring these uh, questions in a quite reasonably general setting. But before going any further, let me just remind you of what singularities are, although for a lot of things in the talk will make sense also for smooth uh, varieties. So if you are not very familiar with singularities, maybe you should not uh, worry too much, but um, the full power of what I'm going to talk about is really when you allow singularity. Uh, now in birational geometry, a pair XB uh, consists of a normal variety X and a boundary divisor B with coefficients from zero to one. Uh, so this is now like the standard setting in, in uh, birational uh, geometry. But if you are not familiar or not comfortable with pairs, in, in most of the places you can just take B to be zero. Just think about one uh, variety. But uh, things become much more interesting when you allow also boundary divisors. Now, given a pair, we can define singularities by comparing it with a resolution. So that means we take a log resolution of this pair. So we make X smooth, we make all the divisors involved uh, with simple normal crossings, 
and we write down the pullback of k plus b as k plus kw plus bw. This bw is then uniquely determined by uh, this setting. And the singularities then are measured by the coefficients of this divided bw. So roughly speaking, the larger the coefficients of bw, the more singular the pair will be. Uh, to be a bit more precise, we define, we say that xb is epsilon log canonical if every coefficient of bw is less than or equal to 1 minus epsilon. Um, so if the coefficients of bw are more than 1, in a sense, this is not good. This not allowed. We can't really say so much about this kind of pair, so we have to restrict ourselves to the case when the coefficients are less than or equal to 1. And being epsilon log canonical, um, so epsilon here is a non-negative number, so in particular means that the coefficients are less than or equal to 1. Um, now, the smaller epsilon is, uh, the larger, the deeper uh, the singularities can be, and the larger the category of these allowed singularities. Um, now, log canonical simply means zero log canonical. And canonical means one log canonical. And KLT means epsilon log canonical for some epsilon. Uh, so this is a quite general definition. And um, maybe at first sight, for people not familiar with the definition, it may look a bit strange, but it works. Simply, these formal definitions seem to be uh, it, it works in, in so many um, situations in birational geometry. So let me just give you some simple examples. If you take X to be a smooth variety and B a simple normal crossing divisor with coefficient 1 or just coefficients between 0 and 1, then we get a log canonical pair. Now, if X is a smooth surface and B is a curve, reduced curve with nodal, uh, singularities, then again we have a log canonical pair. But if you take B to B with cuspidal singularities, then we go out of this category of log canonical singularities. So this is in a way not allowed. If you want to work with this kind of thing, you will have to make some modification. Um, now, an example of a, a log canonical but not KLT singularities is when you take X to be a cone over an elliptic curve and take B to be just zero here. Uh, and something more relevant to this talk maybe is if you take the cone over a rational curve of degree n, then you will get one singularity at the vertex, and this singularity happened to be 2 over n log canonical. So the larger the degree n is, the deeper the singularity will be. In fact, in this case, the singularity is precisely 2 over n log canonical. Um, anyway, so these are just some examples. If you are not comfortable with singularities, just think about smooth varieties and um, devices zero or just with simple normal crossing singularities. Okay, so now I will look at the first question about birational boundedness of uh, linear systems. So suppose that uh, X and N are as are before, so by that I mean that X is a normal projective variety, n is an integral, and nerf and big divisor. Uh, then as I mentioned before, the linear system m times n gives a rational map. This can be empty if the linear system has uh, no elements. Um, but for m large, it will always have some elements, so we will have some rational, even by a rational map. Now the question is, is there a bounded number m such that this rational map phi is birational or not. Uh, this, of course, makes sense only if you say bounded with respect to some invariant. So, for example, you could ask whether there is a bounded M depending only on the dimension or not. Uh, well, that's not um, the case, that's not true. Even in dimension one, there is no bounded M that works for all X and N. In fact, if you just take smooth projective uh, curve x and n to be just one point, uh, then if you want m time n to define a birational map, then the degree of this divisor, which is precisely m, has to be large when um, x is arbitrary. So 
um, if we just fix m, then uh, mn defined by a rational map means that x in fact belongs to a bounded family. The genus will be bounded, and therefore there is no bounded m that works for all xn. Um, so that means that we need to impose some more reasonable conditions to guarantee that there is a bounded m defining by rational maps. And in practice, this means that as almost always that we somehow need to get the canonical divisor x kx involved in this story. Without it, um, so we don't hope to find a, a bounded m. In fact, in the literature already, there, ha there has been extensive studies when n is equal to the canonical divisor or equal to the minus canonical divisor and assuming that these are ample. So either on canonically polarized varieties or final varieties. There has been a lot of work in these directions. Uh, let me just mention some of the most general results. Um, some years ago, Haken, McKinnon, and Zhu proved that if x is log canonical and if n is the canonical divisor and assuming that it's ample, then phi mn is birational for some m depending only on the dimension and no other uh, data, no other invariant. So that's a very nice result. And in the opposite direction, in the final case, uh, a few years ago, I proved that if x is now epsilon log canonical with epsilon fixed and positive, and if n is minus k, then again, mn defines a birational map, this time depending on the dimension and also an epsilon. So it's necessary to also uh, assume this epsilon log canonical because otherwise this will simply fail. So there is no bound depending only on the dimension. Um, in a way, it's just it's suggesting that when you go from general type to uh, more special varieties, like funnels or uh, and so on, the story becomes more complicated and therefore you have to uh, put in more invariants, not only the dimension. Hi, Kosher. Mm -hmm. uh, so here n is uh, anti-ample, right? I mean, canonical class is anti-ample. Uh, in the final case, yes. So n we I mean, you didn't say to you explicitly, but okay. Yeah, so this is the final case. The Haken mechanism uh, true is a general type. Uh, my result is for final. And here we have to uh, allow this epsilon. Uh, and we have to assume epsilon log canonical. Otherwise, even in dimension two, this will fail. Um, anyway, so that's what we knew before. And now I'm going to talk about uh, new results. Um, the first uh, main and I think quite general um, in a way far more general than what we knew before, theorem is, is this uh, theorem. Suppose that now that x is, as before, uh, projective and epsilon log canonical with epsilon positive. And n is, again, integral and f and big. And suppose that n minus k is pseudo-effective. Uh, so, for example, n minus k, if it's like numerically equivalent to some uh, effective divisor, then it will be pseudo-effective. Or if n minus k is big, then automatically this uh, condition will be satisfied. Then in this case, mn always defines a birational map for some m depending only on the dimension and epsilon. And as in the final case, uh, we cannot remove this epsilon or canonical condition. Uh, but in fact, now, an interesting thing about this theorem is that, in a way, I don't really rely on the, the result that I mentioned. So, uh, especially in the case of finals, we get a new proof, which is different from the proof uh, I gave a few years ago. Uh, this one is more direct. The previous proof relied on theory of complements and some very delicate arguments about lifting sections and so on. But this, you know, this one here, this theorem, this approach is, is more direct and we just then in particular get a new proof, uh, in a way simpler proof of this birational, birational bound and that's in the case of final epsilon or canonical final varieties. Um, and as I mentioned, we cannot remove this epsilon or canonical condition. Um, for example, if X is KLT final, arbitrary KLT final of fixed dimension and n is uh, minus k, then in general there is no bounded m. 
uh, even in dimension two. Now, on the other hand, we can remove this epsilon local canonical condition and replace it with KLT, uh, but if we add some other mild assumptions. And this is uh, the statement of the next theorem. This time, assume that X is a projective and KLT, N is again integral and Fn peak, N minus K is pseudo effective as before. And now the additional condition is that K itself is also pseudo effective. So N minus K and K. Then MN again defines a birational map for some M depending only on the dimension. This time there is no epsilon uh, because they just assume KLT. So here depending only on the dimension. Now, so I stated two, uh, two theorems, and in fact, each of these theorems imply the following corollary, um, which uh, is nice in the sense that this statement is quite simple. Suppose that X is a projective KLT Calabio variety, and N is an integral divisor, which is big. We don't even need to assume a net then m times n is birational, defines a birational map for some m depending only on the dimension. Again, there is no epsilon here. Um, and by Calabio here, I simply mean that the canonical divisor is numerically trivial. I don't assume anything about vanishing of homology or simple connectedness and so on. It just means k trivial, as some people call it. Um, so this one is completely uh, new. I think there were only some results, but let me first give you some remarks about uh, this few uh, results that I mentioned. Um, both the theorem, both theorems, and also the corollary, in fact, they hold for pairs. I just stated them in the most simple form without uh, putting in the boundary B. Uh, but of course, we need to assume some conditions on the boundary coefficients. And second remark is that not only m times m defines a birational map, but in fact m times n plus any pseudo-effective divisor, integral divisor L, and even if you throw in the canonical divisor, they all define birational maps. And um, so these linear systems are, are different, uh, even when for example, if uh, in the Calabria case, when k is numerically trivial, when you add k, in fact, the linear system changes, although numerically they are uh, the same. And also this birationality, birationality statement holds for, in fact, for any natural number, m prime more than m. So it's just, uh, you have a bound, and then after that, birationality holds for every natural number. And finally, in fact, um, so I, for simplicity, I assume that n is integral, but this can be replaced by something uh, much more general. It's enough to assume that n is equal to uh, e plus r, where e is integral and pseudo effective, and r has coefficients more than or equal to delta, or it can be zero. So for example, if you just take e to be zero, then this means we are looking at, at an effective divisor with coefficients bounded from below. Then all these birationality statements hold in this setting. Uh, now let me just mention a couple of um, special cases of the corollary that was known before. Uh, the smooth dimension two case goes back uh, to a long time ago, goes back to a reader. Um, the dimension three and terminal singularity case was uh, proved just a few years ago by Jian, and his probe relies on the riemann roch theorem. So for terminal singularities, threefold with terminal singularities, there is a riemann roch theorem depending on the data coming from the singularities. But once you go to dimension four and so on, there is no such uh, uh, riemann roch formula, so we cannot use this technique, but it is nice at least that it works in dimension three. Uh, there were also some other special cases in dimension three, I think like the smooth case and so on, um, due to Fukuda and Ogiso Pitanel, they all go back to the 90s. Uh, much more recently, the case of smooth irreducible symplectic varieties 
and and effective uh, was proved by um, the few people here that I listed. Um, also, so I'm not completely sure if they also prove it for a singular case or not. In the smooth case, if you take x to be smooth projective and n integral nef and big, so it's automatically Cartier. And in fact, we already knew that some bounded multiple is uh, gives you a base point free linear system by uh, effective base point freeness result of scholar. So in the singular case, there is no such result. So the singular case is much more complicated. Okay, so that's the story for uh, birational boundedness. But now I come to the second question. This uh, is when can we guarantee that x n will be bounded? So given a projective variety x and integral f and big n, when can we say that x n form a bounded family? Uh, quite general result in this direction is the following, which looks a bit technical. Uh, I could have removed the boundary divide the b, but I wanted to state it in this form because I will state more related results. Um, so this is saying that suppose that we fix d a natural number and three positive real numbers. And let's look at all the pairs x b projective epsilon log canonical of dimension d. So we are kind of fixing the singularity type and the dimension of the variety. Also, suppose that the coefficients of b are either just zero or that they are not too small. They are bounded from below by delta. And suppose that k plus b is nef, for example, Calabria or just numerically trivial, and n is integral nef and big. And also that the volume of k plus b plus n um, so volume here in this setting is simply the top intersection number. Uh, I'm assuming that this volume is also less than or equal to P. Then such X, B, X, and the support of B form a bounded family. And if in addition, we assume that N itself is also effective, then we can bound X, B, and N all together. Um, so, um, let me give you just some very rough ideas of how this theorem is proved. For simplicity, let's just remove the boundary divisor, b will be zero. Now, if we apply the birational boundedness result uh, I mentioned earlier, then we can find the bounded natural numbers m and l, and an element of the linear system mk plus ln. Um, so this linear system defines a birational map. In particular, there is some uh, uh, non-trivial elements in there. Uh, there is some effective divisor. Now, uh, next step, we show that X and the support of M is birationally bounded. Um, roughly speaking, this means that X is birational to some bounded variety and the support of the strict transform of the support of M is also bounded on the bounded variety together with the exceptional uh, divisors. Uh, then we use all this to show that uh, the low canonical threshold of M is bounded from below. In other words, there is a fixed a positive rational number T such that X T M is low canonical. The T will only depend on the data uh, D, uh, V, delta, and, and so on. It doesn't depend on X M. And from this, then we can derive our, uh, boundedness of X support of M uh, using this canonical threshold and also using the bounded birational model. So roughly that's how it works. And if N itself is effective, then by increasing L, just replace it by L plus one, we can ensure that M is more than or equal to N and therefore support of X and also uh, X and support of N both will be bound. So that's roughly how, how it works. But now let's apply the theorem to a, a special case, to the case of Calabi-Yau's, calabi pairs. Again, suppose that we fix a dimension. Um, this time we have a positive real number V. And now I take phi to be a DCC set of rational numbers. DCC simply means that 
it satisfies the descending chain condition. Uh, in other words, there is no strictly decreasing sequence of numbers uh, here. Uh, for example, you can just take finite, a finite set of rational numbers, then assuming that Xb is a projective KLT, Calabiao, Calabiao again means just K plus B is numerically trivial. We have this pair of dimension T, coefficients of B are in this uh, DCC or finite set phi, N is an integral and nefan big divisor, and the volume of N is at most V then such x support of b form a bounded family and if n itself is effective then we can also bound n um, so if you notice here i'm not assuming epsilon or canonical but just klt and the reason is that in fact in this case all such pairs will automatically be epsilon or canonical for some fixed epsilon And if we relax, uh, relax this nef and bigness of n and just replace it by, by only being big, then the, uh, the theorem implies that x is birationally bounded. You cannot maybe bound uh, x itself, but at least it's, it's birationally. In fact, up to isomorphism in codimension one, x and support of b and n uh, will be bounded. You simply take the minimal model of this n and apply the corollary to that minimum model. And now the thing is that in the Calabria case, so the, the corollary was stated for the KLT singularities, but in fact, in this case, we can go even much uh, further um, to the category of semi canonical pairs. Uh, now let me uh, define, I, I don't define what is semi canonical but Roughly speaking, these are similar to uh, curves with nodal singularities. So these are the higher dimensional version of, of that. And uh, we define a polarized SLC Calabria pair to be a projective SLC, SLC means semi canonical Calabria pair and an ample, so here I don't assume that and big, but ample integral divisor which is effective. And such that x and b plus some small multiple of n is again semi canonical This simply means that the support of n doesn't contain any locanonical center of x, b. Um, so this is, uh, may look a little bit uh, technical, but it's a quite a natural uh, definition from uh, the point of view of uh, minimum model program. Uh, so this is, uh, but you, you can just think about the Calabria and together with some effective and ample device. Uh, then the theorem is that, suppose that D is a natural number, V is a rational, positive rational number, and phi is, a, is again a DCC set, or just assume this is a finite set of rational numbers. Suppose that XBN is a polarized, as I say, Calabria pair of fixed dimension D, Suppose that the coefficients of B are in this uh, finite DCC set and assume that the volume of N is precisely V. Then the set of such X support of B and N form a bounded family. Um, again, similar to the previous uh, theorem, bounding locanonical threshold is in a way that is a, playing a key role in the proof of this, uh, this theorem. In fact, what we show in a more general setting, and not just uh, this uh, setting of the, the theorem, we show that there is some fixed positive rational number T, such that X B plus T N is semi canonical uh, and this T will just depend on D, V, and, and phi. So in particular, um, we get a stable pair, and then we apply a result a recent result of Haken, McKenna, and Drew, which say that this kind of pair should be bounded. So uh, the key in our case is bounding this locanonical threshold. Uh, now, having these kind of uh, bounded uh, uh, statements, in fact, that the, this that I mentioned, this theorem, is something that people working in the module I have been looking for for, for a long time. and. So now surprisingly, this will 
um, naturally lead us to moduli problems. Uh, in fact, if we combine the bounded results with, mo with moduli theory of stable pairs, then we get existence of projective coarse moduli spaces for polarized semi-locanonical pairs and uh, even more, which I will, um, more restricted classes that I will talk about in a few minutes. But let me first just say a few things about stable pairs. Uh, the subject of stable pairs and their moduli has a, a quite long history. It goes back to Delin Mumford, and then so Delin, Delin Mumford they constructed moduli of uh, stable curves, curves with nodal singularities, and then Kohler and Schiffer Baron uh, they did that for the case of uh, surfaces. Um, I mean they introduced uh, semi canonical singularities and the foundations of the subject for uh, surfaces, and then Alexiev did. Uh, the case of surfaces, general type, and uh, over uh, many years, Kola has done many work in this uh, direction just to, um, in a way, clarify what exactly the modular problem should be, and he uh, did uh, many of the technicalities, and here today I'm following him for definitions, notation, and also results. Um, so let's now fix a natural number D which will be the dimension and two positive rational numbers, C and V. Uh, a stable pair now is a connected, projective, pure dimensional semi-locanonical pair X delta with K plus delta ample. Uh, this is just a higher dimensional version of stable curves. In the case of stable curves, you have a bunch of curves uh, intersect. Their singularity will be a nodal, um, the curves themselves can have singularities and their intersections will be also nodal singularities and um, you have a boundary divided delta, the delta uh, it will not contain any component, divisorial component of these singularities and then the condition in that case will be degree of k plus uh, delta should be positive which simply means uh, k plus delta is ample. Now if we take the dimension of x to be d if delta is c times some effective integral divisor d, and if the volume of k plus delta is v, then we say that this stable pair x delta is a d c v stable pair. It just fixes some invariance of the, the stable pair. Now it take, uh, takes a lot more, more work to define what stable families, DCV stable families should be over some scheme, uh, but these things have been clarified, uh, fortunately, thanks to Kohler. Um, so roughly, very roughly speaking, such a family will be a flat projective family where the log fibers, the fibers X and delta over points of the base will be DCV stable pairs. Uh, now, so that's, uh, that's the story for stable uh, pairs, uh, but now we come to the polarized Calabi-Yau. In a sense, you could say stable Calabi-Yau pairs. And uh, again, there has been work in this direction by Alexiev, uh, Hakin, Lassa, Jeff Fleming, Kualajou, and so on. So I'm following them for um, some other definitions. Um, this time, a DCV polarized SLC Calabi-Yau pair, or if you like a stable Calabi-Yau pair, is defined by the following uh, data. First, uh, we have the Calabi-Yau pair itself, which is XB. Now XB plus U times N is a stable pair of dimension D for some, maybe very small, but not fixed, uh, positive rational number U. So we have such a stable pair. Uh, we assume that the coefficients of B are controlled by DC, which means that B is equal to C times D for some integral divisor D. And N itself is an integral divisor, effective. Uh, K plus B is Q linearly, or just say numerically trivial. So this is the Calabi-Yau condition. And the volume of this divisor N is precisely V. Now, if you notice, K plus B is 
trivial, but k plus b plus u n is ample. So that means that n itself must be an ample device. So this is a color and polarized by uh, it's pretty much the, the definition that uh, you mentioned before, except that now we have made it more precise by this data D, C, and V. And now a family of D, C, V polarized Calabria pairs over a reduced scheme S over the ground field K is defined similarly by the following data. So we, in a way, we make everything in relative. Uh, this time, X B plus U N to S is a stable family in the sense of color with phi beta being of dimension D and for some U here, which is not fixed. Uh, again, as before, see that we have fixed D, C and V, but U here is not fixed. And B is C times D for some integral divisor, but just being integral is not enough. It's for some a relative Manford divisor, effective divisor D. Uh, roughly speaking, being Manford divisor means that generically it's a Cartier divisor on some um, big open set. Uh, now, I don't go into the, the details. Uh, also, N is again an effective and relative Manford divisor. So, this is just a relative notion of being integral. Uh, and we have the Calabria condition that K x over s plus b is hulianely trivial over s. And finally, for any fiber xs, the volume of n restricted to this fiber is precisely v. So in particular, if you restrict to fibers of the morphism x to s, you just get dcv uh, polarized SLC Calabiao pairs. Uh, now, knowing what families are, then we can define a moduli functor, which I will denote it by PCY, which means polarized Calabi-Yaws, with respect to this data D, C, and V. This is defined on reduced uh, schemes by setting, uh, so its values over S will be all the families of D, C, V polarized calabi pairs up to isomorphism over S. So this defines a moduli functor. And the main result here is that this functor has a projective and coarse uh, moduli space. Uh, in fact, just last year, Kola and Zhu, uh, they proved, they argued in a slightly different way by um, a limiting process inside the moduli space of stable pairs. Uh, they identify a moduli space for this uh, functor. And they show that each irreducible component is projective, but potentially the moduli space could have infinitely many components. But at least they show that each component, each irreducible component, is irreducible. But uh, the bound and the result that I mentioned uh, some minutes ago says that in fact this moduli space has to have only finitely many components. It's a finite type, and therefore it is uh, projective. And there are results related to this by Alexiev on modular abelian varieties of K3 surfaces and, and so on. Um, and for the proof, I uh, argue a little slightly different from Kola and Shu by taking a more direct approach. Um, here, what I do is that I take a DCV polarized Calabria pair, let's say X, B, and N, and applying the boundedness results before. Uh, then xb plus tn is a bounded stable pair for some fixed rational number t. And therefore, this allows us to embed this x together with the divisors into some fixed projective space pn. Uh, then we show that there is a modulized space for these embedded polarized Calabria pairs, and this just relies on uh, existence of moduli of embedded stable pairs uh, by Kola. Uh, so in a sense here, we work at the level of Hilbert schemes and schemes that parameterize uh, families of devices. And then when all this is done, then we, uh, we have a natural group action uh, by some productive group, and we take the quotient of this and it will give the moduli space. Um, so it's well known that this moduli space should be uh, proper 
uh, just simply because if you have families over a curve, you can compactify it. Maybe after a finite phase change, your family over the whole, uh, over the compactification of the curve, so the modular space will be uh, proper. And then finally, you apply uh, um, a lemma, a result of Kohler for proving projectivity of these uh, modular spaces by using also recent results of Fugino and Kovar and Patakvalvi about semi-positivity of direct images of uh, log devices. So that's uh, the story for moduli of Calabiao, polar Calabiao pairs. But uh, now if we restrict ourselves to a subclass in a sense, we can also form moduli spaces of polarized funnel uh, pairs. So we can define things in a similar um, way. Again, we fix a natural number D and uh, this time we fix three positive rational numbers, C and A and V. Uh, then a D, C, A, V polarized SLC final pair is defined by the following data. So this is similar to the Calabi our case, but we just do some changes. Here we assume that X, B plus U, N is a stable pair of dimension D for some rational number U. This time this is more than A, not more than zero, but more than A. And similarly, B is C times D for some integral effective divisor D. N is an integral uh, divisor effective. And this time, instead of K plus B being uh, Q linearly trivial, we say K plus B plus A N is Q linearly trivial. And also the volume of N should be V. So all these assumptions in particular imply that N is an ample divisor and therefore K plus B is an anti-ample divisor. And therefore that's why this is a, a final pair polarized by some ample divisor with fixed volume dimension and so on. And now families of the CAV polarized final pairs and their moduli functor also can be defined in a similar uh, way. So I'm not repeating all those things. And then again, the main result here is that this functor has a projective moduli space and its proof is more or less the same as, as before. You just need to make some adjustments uh, by this data here, these devices. Okay, so I have stated basically all the results that I wanted to say, but let me also say there are some special cases of this theorem. Uh, before Hacking treated the case X smoothable, uh, when you take only those X that are smoothable, they can be deformed to P2. In fact, in a way this, you could say that also the definition of this polarized Calabi alphabet maybe uh, uh, originates from his work. And then uh, also more recently, Dürpurka and Han, they treated the case when you have X, which is deforming to P1 cross P1. So in particular, these are two dimensional cases. Uh, again, not long time ago, uh, Dev Lemming, uh, she treated the case when you take X to be smoothable to as smooth, fixed smooth final varieties, for example, smoothable to some PN. And then she proved this result. So this is all the result that I wanted to talk about, but in the remaining uh, few minutes, maybe I will say something about the proofs of some of these results. Uh, let me go back to the birational boundedness. In a way, this is the key to all these uh, results here, is the basis of, uh, of all the other results. Uh, I will give you a very rough sketch of its proof, which is quite long, the proof itself. Uh, let me also just remind you of the statement. The statement was that if X is a smooth, uh, not smooth, it's F, X is a projective and epsilon low canonical pair, epsilon here is positive, and N is an F integral, an F and B integral divisor, N minus K is pseudo effective. Then we want to show that M times N defines a birational map for some M depending on the on dimension and epsilon. Now, to show such birationality is enough 
uh, to find the boundary number m so that if we take any pair x, y of uh, general closed points of x and possibly switching, changing x and y, and then we want to find the divisor delta effective q linearly equivalent to m n minus k such that x delta is log canonical at x and x itself, this point is an isolated log canonical center, but x b is not klt at y. Uh, so we have two non klt sets, one is just x itself and then some other set containing y but not intersecting x. If we can do this for every uh, x, y, then using vanishing theorems and multiplier uh, ideals, we can construct a section alpha of mn, which vanishes at y, but not at x, and vice versa. Um, now this technique, this basic strategy has been used in fact for a very long time, at least for several uh, decades. Uh, it goes back at least as far as uh, Angers, Sue, work, and possibly even, even earlier. Um, in, in fact, a baby version of this in a different setting already appears in Searle's uh, theorem on characterizing affine schemes by cohomology. He, in fact, if you just look at Harshon, you see that at some point he takes a, a scheme, there is a point on it, and then some close subset uh, not, in, not containing this point, and then he uses cohomology to uh, construct a section not vanishing at x but vanishing at uh, the other points and here is just using cohomology by lifting a section from this point. So basically it's the same idea but the setting in a way is quite different and here the vanishing is different because we use something like Karmata physics vanishing but in the case of cell vanishing just comes for free is just by assumption. Um, anyway so this is a strategy that has been used for a very long time and in fact, um, every time there is a new insight, a new key idea, this strategy gives something uh, really powerful. And in a sense, that's what also really happens in uh, here. Um, so to, pro to proceed, what we do to construct this, this divisor delta in the setting of the theorem, we reduce first to the case when n minus k and n plus k are both big. Uh, we can make n minus k big just by some triviality, just replace n by like 2n, but making n plus k big is much more subtle. And this in fact relies on the BAB, on boundaries of final varieties. And then we pick some m, for the moment we don't know whether this is bounded or not, pick some m such that m times n minus k, its volume is more than 2d times d. d is here is the dimension. So n is uh, less than big, therefore if m is sufficiently large, then we can always find, find such an, an m. Uh, initially we take m to be minimal with this uh, property. Uh, then we find by some more or less simple argument that there is in fact a delta satisfying those uh, kind of assumptions as before, except that uh, this time x delta is log canonical at x with a unique log canonical center g passing through x, but x delta is not klt. So the difference with uh, the statement before is that here x itself is not an isolated uh, log canonical center, but there is some other isolated center passing through x and the idea basically is to do somehow induction and cut down this G until we arrive at the case where dimension is zero. So if already dimension of G is equal to zero, then as I said before, we get by rationality, but in the end we somehow need to bound M itself. That uses a bit different arguments. Now, <clears throat> the difficult part is that if dimension of G is positive, then we should show somehow that volume of m times n restricted to g is bounded from below in order to replace g and decrease the dimension. Uh, so, so far everything I have said is in a way quite old, it goes back to the 90s. Um, now, a new uh, development by Haken, Macken and Drew a few years ago was that 
uh, if you restrict this device mn, which is the same as k plus delta to f, where f is the normalization of uh, g, then you can write it down. We have a kind of a juncture formula. You can write it down as delta of theta f plus pf, where theta is a boundary divisor, p is a big uh, divisor. And then, um, you know, and more or less for free, we will also get the fact that f has to be birationally bound, bounded, so birational to some bounded model. We can assume this. And now, uh, one of the other uh, uh, development was a few years ago in my work on final varieties that if we study the singularities of this uh, pair f theta plus p, then we can say a lot of things. We can say things about the boundedness. In particular, if this pair has really bad singularities, then we somehow can bound the volume of mn restricted to g uh, by comparing singularities with those on the bounded by rational model f prime. Um, now, this allows us to reduce to the case when f, when this pair is half epsilon low canonical. So in other words, the singularities are not too bad. Um, now, for this to work in the case of Fanos, I had to use the theory of complements and also some delicate arguments about uh, the case when x itself has very nice singularity, like almost canonical, in order to be able to lift the section from f to the ambient space and, uh, and then proceed as something like uh, a complement. But we don't have complements here. The n is uh, just an f and big integral divisor. So uh, what we do here, the key new insight is that we can work in a way more direct in this case, we can in fact show that the restriction of n to f is again an integral divisor, but maybe up to multiplying n with some bounded number, which will depend on this uh, epsilon. And therefore, if we replace the m, we can assume that mn restricted to f is an integral divisor. Uh, now, from the construction, mn restricted to f minus kf is also big. And therefore, applying induction of the dimension, we show that mn restricted to f is, it defines a birational map. And therefore, the volume of this divisor mn restricted to f or g must be more than or equal to one. And that's exactly what we were looking for, to bound this volume from below. Uh, but eventually, we will have to also show that m itself is uh, bounded. So very roughly speaking, that's how the argument goes. Uh, in a way, the new ideas are around here, how to use these singularities and also this integrality. And just give you some remarks. If n, when we start with, if n is the canonical divisor or the anti-canonical divisor, we in fact don't need to use the BAB conjecture because in that case, n plus k will more or less automatically will be big. We just replace n by some uh, multiple. And therefore, we don't need, need to use the BAB conjecture. And that's why uh, we get a new proof of the statement for the final case. Uh, in a way, we also get really a, a new, well, maybe not a new proof in the case of k ample, because we are not relying on directly on the result of Haken, Meccan, and Drew. But the thing is that if you assume this from the beginning, then much of the difficulty actually just uh, evaporates. And in a way, that proof somehow uh, becomes converges to their proof. So in a way, that's not very new. But in the final case, definitely, it's quite new. Uh, also, if I start with n instead of being integral, if I assume n is e plus r, where e is integral pseudo-effective coefficients of r are bounded from below, then we can also show that n restricted to f is the same as e restricted to f plus r restricted to f has the same kind of property that e will be integral to the effective r coefficients bounded from below. And okay, so I wanted also to say something about boundedness of polarized collider operators, but I think there is only a couple of minutes less, uh, left, so let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Kosher. And uh, let's think. So, uh, 
Any questions? Okay, so uh, Dan, do you want to repeat your question? Yeah, uh, I think it was in the Calabiao case, you assumed that you applied the moduli problem only to reduce spaces. Um, is that necessary given Kola's new definition? Um, not really. I mean, it works, for, should work for arbitrary basis, but uh, it's just for the sake of definitions, basically, because in the when the, the base is reduced, then defining what is a family is simpler. So that's why I just restrict, restrict myself to that. But eventually, this should work for, in fact, it should work uh, for arbitrary base scheme. Uh, but also, instead of working over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, it should also work for just working over the rational numbers, I think. And therefore, uh, once you get a moduli set over the rational numbers, then it should give you moduli spaces for any other scheme. A reasonable scheme over stack of the rational numbers. Any any other questions? Okay, so uh, it looks like we don't have more questions. Uh, so uh, yeah, yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so just for one clarification clarification so uh, after your boundedness argument uh, to argue uh, moduli so I think we, uh, so you read uh, that what you meant by polarization is divisor right uh, Not uh, like what I mean by polarization is that the question yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but the polarization is given by this divisor n because divisor, it's, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a divisor That's effective right. divisor yes I think when, when you discuss the boundedness, uh, you don't need to, to be fixed about divisor, but just the divisor class, right? I think if you discuss moduli, then you fix divisor, right? Yes, the thing is for the boundedness, uh, if you work on the semi low canonical case, then um, we are assuming that when we say polarized, we're assuming that N does not contain low canonical centers and in a way that really only makes sense when n is effective if it's just a divisor class without effectivity then basically that doesn't make sense unless you assume that it's like numerically equivalent to something which is integral effective not containing any lc center but that's in a way that's just uh, sort of the same thing okay thank you Thank you, Yudja, and thank you, Kosher. So, uh, any other questions to Kosher? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Kosher again for oh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I recorded it and I will upload it to the web page of the Zach seminar in uh, half an hour. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, see you next week. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks Kosher. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks, bye.